Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fast Forward Podcast. I'm Joanna Jordi from Fast Forward 2030 Lebanon. How do we move forth while leaving no one behind? Today, with the growing dangers of global warming and the imminent presence of violence and injustice, so many people around the world are going through hardships and crises varying from natural disasters to wars. So how do we tackle this uh, growing global challenge? Many social entrepreneurships are rising to the occasion. Our guest today, Laura Jardine Patterson, founder of Conca, is dedicated to hiring uh, developers uh, in her company from the refugee communities. Laura, welcome to Fast Forward Podcast. Thank you for having me. Very nice to be here. What inspired you to uh, found CONCAT? Um, so I've been living in Lebanon for about three years on and off. And I was working for an NGO um, that trains uh, marginalized youth to become developers. And I saw from that uh, post program, the inequality um, between the, the graduates, particularly the non-Lebanese, the women and the Lebanese. Um, so what I started to do was try to connect people around the world who wanted websites to the developers who were sort of the most marginalized um, or who had, you know, difficult home situations, which meant that they couldn't go to an office from nine until five and this kind of thing. Um, and slowly, slowly it grew and suddenly we got loads of clients. <laughs> so I launched Concat officially. This was actually last year, and then January this year, I launched Concat officially. Great. So how can this initiative grow? So I chose to register it um, as a UK business. So it's, it's for profit, um, and it's based in the UK. Um, and the idea is to hire developers from countries of conflict, um, focus specifically on women or refugees, and to try and connect them to employment all over the world, focusing specifically on the countries of conflict. So we know the situation in Lebanon, um, although it's not a country of conflict as such yet, it's, it's in a bad situation. Um, so most of the team are based here, and I hope to grow the team in Syria. We have a small team in Syria and Iraq, um, and hopefully we can grow into more countries soon. Um, but the idea is now it's just for websites, but I want to move into mobile apps and uh, maybe look into kind of offering SEO and marketing and branding as well. It's a great way to create symbiotic relationships where you offer jobs to people who have uh, different experiences uh, going through hardship. So having a new perception of life at the yeah. same time, it offers them an opportunity that, that they definitely need given their situation. So uh, do you have any particular uh, story that, uh, that touched you and that motivated you more to, uh, uh, to go on uh, accomplishing what you do? Um, yeah, so my, in one of our first team meetings, um, Bob, who's one of my developers, one of the most senior guys, we started like talking about what we're going to do and and I was interviewing for uh, a program called She Entrepreneurs, which basically there's 30 of us females in the MENA region, so Middle East and Northern Africa. Uh, so I was interviewing to be selected into this program and it's for six months um, and we meet every week and talk about entrepreneurship and our businesses all around, all around the MENA and all different stages. Anyway, they interviewed me and they asked me um, what my team would say about me. <laughs> and I thought, I never asked. I never, I, it's been so busy. I never took the time. So this was like maybe February or, or March when everything was so hard. Like when you're working full time and you start a startup, it's very hard. Anyway, so I say to my team, you know, they asked me today in this interview, what, what, what you guys would say about me. And um, Bob, he said, what Concat's given us the freedom to live again. And my heart, I went completely bright red. And I was like, huh? what? <laughs> and I realized then that uh, like the impact that it can have on, on such people and their families. 
Um, and since that day, I was like, yalla, we have to grow this. Yeah. It's very inspiring. Lovely, lovely indeed. Uh, in your perception, how do you think corp mainstream corporate culture needs to shift behavior in order to move forth in implementing global goals? Yeah, so my whole concept is that people should be hired based on their talent, irrespective of their nationality, gender or location, or sometimes also experience, right? Like if I have somebody who comes to me, they are in a very bad situation, they say to me, I've learned this on my own, I've done this on my own, I've learned English on my own, I haven't been to university, I'm gonna learn this, I'm super committed, all of this. I say, yalla, come, join. It doesn't matter if that you haven't been to university, it shouldn't matter, it shouldn't matter where you're based, it shouldn't matter, uh, like the whole model of working from nine until five is outdated now, I think, and COVID has only further um, highlighted that. And now you should be able to work wherever you are, as long as you have access to internet and a uh, laptop, which I understand for some people is, is very difficult. But all of my team, they work flexibly. They work when they want. They work on a project basis. So if they have a, a particular problem at home, for example, they say, Halas, no, I don't have time this month. Next time I take more projects, something. It's all about them and it's all led by them. It's not me. It's not me and, you know, a group of, white middle-class men at the top dictating how they should live and how they should work. And I think this is the future of business. Like it's this idea of impact led business. If the people, if the business is the business is like USP is impact, then that impact should lead the business, right? It shouldn't be we're a corporation and we give 15% of our profits to refugees or to a charity. That's actually no longer good enough. And I think that is outdated. And launching a company now, you have to have to, you should have, it should be your responsibility to have some sort of impact, whether it's uh, economically, socially, environmentally, but, but it needs to be more than just, oh, we give X amount of our revenue to a cause. Um, and I think with that, it's just awareness of the SDGs. Everybody can commit to them and everybody can change their business model to maximize the the impact of the sdgs on their business um and it's a small thing that can lead to big change if we all do it together wonderful so it's about throwing away stereotypes and just really focusing on individual and the relationship with the community and serving both 100 percent. Mm. but it's hard right it's like every day you have to fight for it and of course we make mistakes and you learn and as you go especially as an entrepreneur um, but it's important that whatever you do is aligned with those with a mission and with the SDGs for example for the SDGs it's super important to me that whatever we do you know it works towards the the goals that we're dedicated to um, and I think that it is difficult and maybe sometimes I make the mistakes of going in the wrong direction maybe not doing the best thing for the for the goals and for the mission but either way you try to go back you learn you go again but you have to just keep keep moving forward and keep striving okay, so you keep yourself in check always uh, seeing what you could do better and always evaluating your performance and how you serve and how you could serve better which is for sure yeah definitely. and always how you can give more like the whole point of Concat is not is not for me you know it's not for me to make money it's for it's for our clients to meet and inter interact with different communities from around the world to realize that they can themselves can hire directly from these from these countries you know all my clients now they come to me and they're like wow you know your team are so amazing they i've never met anyone working in lebanon i've never met somebody from syria and that is what we should be doing and that awareness in itself is huge so the idea that we could then start working with corporates and larger organizations to sort of spread the me message and awareness, but also advocate for the rest of the talent in the region. Like the amount of developers that I meet in Lebanon who are super talented, have no access to employment, or they work for so little money. Um, it's, it's crazy. And it's, it's sort of all about advocating for that and the talent in the region, you know, each project at a time. Brilliant. So there's this wonderful quality of integrating diversity and really opening 100%. up to 
anything that is new or different. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Definitely. And you do that. I think the whole thing, my whole thing is about, my favorite quote is by Walt Disney that says the way to get started is to quit talking and to and begin do. doing. Yes. And just do, yeah. <laughs> and actually that is what I did with Tomcat. I had no idea what I was doing at the beginning. Um, everybody I spoke to said the same thing. Everybody said, I don't know either. We just do it. And it's my favorite thing. Like if you see something that makes you angry in the world or that you find difficult, just try, try to do something even small, like why I started Tomcat and you learn a long way. As per your experience, how can we cultivate culture that is more inclusive and, yep. uh, and not segregational? Yeah, so this, I think, is always something that I try to, I'm, it's quite a sensitive topic. Um, and I think there is pushback from different communities about who's the priority to work with who at different times within the kind of histories of these countries. So for me, um, it was, it's my most important thing is working with marginalized communities, right? It's so maybe three years ago in Lebanon, the situation for refugees and um, non-host communities maybe was more difficult than it was for the Lebanese. But now the situation here is terrible for both, for both parties. So why maybe now we have to, you know, you sort of adapt to the situation. And maybe initially I started just working with refugees and women, um, but that in itself can come across in sort of inconclusive, in uninclusive in itself. So it's not that we just work with them, but they are our priority uh, communities. Um, but again, like we are, I think the whole part of being inclusive is that you can adapt and be flexible. If you find, for me, for example, if I find a Lebanese now who is super talented in a very bad situation, as a lot of people are, you know what, there's no reason to stop, to not hire them. But the, the voice predominantly will be for refugees and for women. Um, and the whole, the whole point, there'll always be more refugees and more women working at Comcat. But the whole thing for me and working inclusively is that you can't just work with one and forget about the other. You know, you have to acknowledge all the people, um, particularly in a country like Lebanon, um, and not forget about either, either party. How do we create women leaders? How do we create women leaders? Um, I think that we have to start at an early, early age with uh, education and examples. I think if you, I think when I was in school, like it's all just men, all the textbooks, all the scientists, everything is just men. It's changing, it's changing straight away. But I think for me, um, I, I kind of just always was meant to be a leader, I guess. I was always super confident and just was like, I'm going to do it no matter what anybody says. But I think if you don't have an example of that and you don't grow up in a culture where there are other strong women, then it can be very difficult to imagine yourself as a leader. Um, I think that's why it's up to the education systems um, to give examples of women, to get, you know, to get people to come in and speak to, um, to the students, whether they're young or at university, wherever it is, because you need to see an example and have an inspiration, I think, within somebody else to realize that you can do it yourself. So I think a lot of it is women who are leaders now speaking up about the challenges, the many challenges that we have, and also being, being vulnerable about our mistakes and the problems that we face. It's not about being super strong and knowing everything and doing everything right. It's about like sharing our experiences and creating communities around that, I think. Definitely, so leading by example and being honest and transparent about the challenges and about um, doing our best to, to solve those challenges, one step at a time. Definitely, and without ego. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, it's hard, to, it's hard for some men to not have an ego. <laughs> but for us, it's, it's maybe slightly easier because we, we doubt ourselves so much more. But I think 
if you're honest uh yeah and transparent about what you're doing and what you're struggling with then that automatically hopefully will become inspirational definitely so what's your advice to emerging entrepreneurs who are tackling sustainable development goals um a lot of what we do is what i said before i think is just keeping track of everything that you do and making sure that it's aligned to the SDGs that you're working for. Um, some of them are a little bit more tricky to track. For example, uh, like no poverty. I'm not going to end all poverty through CONCAT, obviously, yeah. but it's, it's like slowly steps towards it. And it can be very overwhelming, I think, when you look at all the information about the SDGs on the website and you think, for sure, I'm not going to, help with that or not play a big part of that but even if you're giving you know even if you're giving a little bit of money or you know you're working on a gender equality project with three or four women or three or four men that is a step closer to ending it right so it's not to look at and be you know you see these millions and figures of thousands and millions and you think my project's so small it's never going to be part of that but everything all of us working together to one goal let's say for no poverty um all of us together no matter how small together we we make it we make it bigger and we can have more of an impact together so don't be don't think oh my program is just too small it's nothing i thought that a lot at the beginning of conca actually but every day you have more of an impact and further further the goal so don't be overwhelmed at the beginning about you know having to commit to hundreds of people for one goal you can start slowly and build from there definitely if it's an entire community if it's an entire world community that is focused on this one guiding star which is uh, symbolized by the sustainable development goals that are exactly. also being studied and developed as well according to to our needs and according to scientific studies that yeah. are identifying human needs and what the planet needs and it's I mean, they're also useful as a sort of guideline. I think definitely. It's, it would be easy, you know, for CONCAT, for example, we work on many things. We work on gender equality, reduced inequalities, but these maybe would never have been framed in such a way as the SDGs. You know, they sort of, they give us a framework and they give us a sort of subject of the work that we're working on in a way that is super concise and clear. And within that, you sort of have steps to reach, to help you reach the goal. Okay. So in Lebanon, despite of our current situation, our current difficult situation, we have so many dreams for Lebanon and so much ambition going forth. So how do you envision Lebanon going forth in achieving sustainable development goals? Um, that's a big question. <laughs> I think that the the spirit of the people in Lebanon is what makes it such an incredible place that through everything that they face, you know, that we face, I should say me, I'm here, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the spirit of Lebanese people is unbelievable. People living in Lebanon, not just Lebanese. Um, the hardship that they face is, is unbelievable. Like, you can't even imagine from waking up in the morning, how, if you, that's if you've even slept in the night because there's no electricity and no fuel for anything, um, especially in now in the summer heat, it's, it's, it's too much. But like I say, I think it starts with spreading the awareness of the SDGs and then sort of slowly, slowly committing to, to, to one of them maybe or a couple of them within their own communities. So obviously there's 17 global goals. It's not about tackling all of them at the same time. I think it's about pinpointing which ones are uh, kind of the most sustainable, the most suitable within the community that you're working with or in um, and sort of going towards that. I'm not sure that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yes. I wanted to know more about your experience in, because you're in Lebanon, actually, and you got to know the yeah. people and the culture. So I want to know more about your experience in being in Lebanon. So uh, other than the hardships as well, and you also yeah. encountered people that you found uh, really interesting and special. Yeah. So I came first in 2018 
and I came for one week and I never left. <laughs> I've been here now since then. Um, I quit my job, left my house, everything. Um, but because I never been to a place like Lebanon in my life, from the minute you arrive, everybody wants to help you. They're the, like, I don't know how you guys are so generous. From, from then till now, even now, we have so little, some people, but they still give you everything and they will do anything for you. Even now, there's no fuel, but you'll, my Lebanese friend will still drive me, you know, the extra 20 minutes, whatever, to help me. And you think how, how you have so little and you still, you know, are still so generous and so strong, like the spirit in the Sauda in 2019. I've never seen anything like that, like the hope and the, the spirit of everybody coming together. I've never experienced anything like that in my life. Um, and I think that there's a real sense of community in Lebanon. Uh, the family is, you know, at the forefront of everything that you do. You have a, a very strong culture of coming together and drinking coffee and having shisha, or whatever you do. Um, that is super inclusive of everyone. Like even as a foreigner, um, people always say, come to my house, you know, come to, to the mountains with my family on Sunday for lunch. And you think, well, I just met you. Now you're inviting me to your house. Um, and I think it's just like an infectious way of life that you've grown up never knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. So there's no plans. Everybody just wakes up. You want to go to the beach? Sure. Well, let's go. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So let's just live today like it's the best day ever. And I think that's a very refreshing um, concept for a lot of foreigners who are sort of you know, I mean, in England, I feel kind of restricted by the constraints of society. You know, we work from nine until five and then we go, we go see our friends or whatever. But here, there's none of that. Everything's planned in the UK, but here you can't plan because now, I mean, you don't have any petrol, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> but still, like the people here, they have the biggest sense of pride and sort of happiness and and. They, everybody just wants to have a good time despite the situation and that is that is because of the spirit I think and the strength of people oh, and, the food, and the food and the food and the food can't forget the food <laughs> yeah food is great yeah it's, it's a very it's a very old culture that was built upon so many generations and so many hardships as well throughout the different generations that uh, yeah that kind of made that spirit because I think also hardships uh, play a role in, in building what is beautiful and what is special about uh, a community or an individual as well. They help Definitely. shape it. Yes. But also what makes this situation now so heartbreaking. You know, so many of my parents, so many of my friends' parents are sort of completely heartbroken by the situation because they've been through it all before. You know, now some people are saying that it was even worse than it was. And they've tried everything. They've, you know, now they've lost their savings in their banks. And I'm, you know, I talk about this to, to raise awareness of it, not to educate yourself, because you know probably much more. But that's what's so heartbreaking to see that they've had such a turbulent history and now it's back in the present again. Yeah, definitely. The violence that we're going through at the moment and the hardship, it's, uh, it's unprecedented. That's very true. Yeah. But we're looking for ways to, to overcome it because we, we do have faith and we do have strength and uh, we're warriors in the end. So we want to, 100%. Keep, we want to keep that spirit. And we're so, here to help. And definitely. We'll through it. <laughs> much appreciated. So Laura, thank you so much for inspiring us um, and for sharing your experience with us. Uh, thank thank you. you so much for also for inspiring the, the implementation of sustainable development goals. So... From fast forward 2030 Lebanon, let us honor our natural and human heritage to create the best life conditions possible for future generations. Definitely. And we're in it together. <laughs> Yay, yes.